Hi, I'm Andrew Tsao. In this episode of Backstory, we're talking about The Church on Dauphine Street, a documentary about rebuilding in the devastating wake of Hurricane Katrina. The film follows two unlikely kindred spirits as they work closely with volunteers to reconstruct the Blessed Silos Catholic Church and reunite one of New Orleans' most unusual congregations. With us today is filmmaker Anne Hadrine. Anne, welcome to Backstory. Thanks. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. You know, as I was watching the film, Anne, I noticed that immediately we meet the people who have come to volunteer their time to help rebuild the congregation and the church, and they're from the Seattle area. I mean, right away, we, we, I, I heard that and I thought, how did this come about? I know people from all over the country went down, but I realized there was a connection between the filmmaking team and the volunteers. How did that all come about in terms of the documentary? It's just one of those quirky things that happen in life. We had known Jack Van Hardesvelt, who led that team okay. from Seattle that went down uh, through a previous documentary. He, um, Jack's an interesting guy. He lives in Mercer Island. He does a lot of business in New Orleans. Okay. Um, he also, his avocation, you might even say his passion or his mission, is rebuilding churches. He loves to do that. He's, yeah. he's a carpenter. His fam he comes from a family of carpenters. So anyway, he had organized the rebuilding of an historic African-American church, Madrona Presbyterian, and led this amazing team that rebuilt that church. And we did a short documentary about that for the Seattle Presbytery and uh -huh. got to know him a little bit through uh -huh. that. So then when he went down to New Orleans after Katrina and saw what was going on there, he just felt moved to get his team together and go down. And he um, and a few people uh, from Mercer Island Presbyterian actually went down there and started looking for a church. What they wanted was a church that was in a neighborhood that was not completely destroyed. In other words, people were trying to uh, rebuild. Rebuild the neighborhood. But so so yeah. the the... Blessed Silos is not in the Ninth Ward? It is about 12 blocks from the Ninth Ward. Understood, okay. And it's on a street that sits a little bit high. Okay. And so it suffered some pretty severe wind damage, but it was not smashed to smithereens. In other words, there was a chance at restoring yeah. this building. Yeah, and immediately after the hurricane, it became a place where people gathered. Right. Um, and he recognized that and said, you know, this makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I noticed it stated early that uh, a number of congregations mm -hmm. had come together because this was a, a place that still stood and mm -hmm. had the chance of becoming uh, restored once again. So, right. so how did your involvement then take place with yeah. this endeavor? Well, we met with Jack and he said, you know, I'd love for you to come down and do okay. something like you did on Madrona. But okay. the more he told us about Blessed Silos, the fact that it serves all the deaf Catholics yep. in the New Orleans Archdiocese and the fact that it also serves all the uh, many of the Hispanic immigrants to New Orleans with its Spanish services. It just it sounded like such an interesting place and we said Jack you know there might be more here than yeah. just a short DVD for the volunteers so to that, take home. That was the initial idea was just something as a record of mm -hmm. the reconstruction but suddenly as you, now did this occur when you went down there is this in your process of making the film, is this something that you discovered while you were on the ground or, or you had come up with this idea before? Even sitting here in Seattle and hearing Jack describe Blessed Silos yeah. and what was going on there, we had an inkling that there might be a longer story. Okay. But it was it was nice that the, the our deal with him was pay our expenses and, you know, we'll shoot for you yeah. and then we'll see. Yeah. You know, we'll see what we've got. And when we went down there, I think what clinched it was meeting Father Joe okay. and meeting our scene. Okay. And they were so wonderful and expansive and generous with their stories. And they, it, we thought, you know, this, is, this could be a really compelling film. You know, the film is obviously much more than a document on the rebuilding of a church. Um, the church and the congregations that gather there are, are really... Um, you know, about community mm -hmm. and about the uh, meaning of community. And this becomes clear as you experience your film. And it seems, I'm going to say, unique to that area. Mm -hmm. you, you just referenced the different uh, uh, variations of people that would come together in this one sort of uh, 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 place. And can you talk a little bit about, as you were making the film, what you discovered mm -hmm. about that particular, what's the name of the neighborhood? 
again? Uh, the bywater. Okay, this is the bywater. So it seems to have a very unique sort of identity in terms of the way uh, this place of faith defines the yeah. community. It's always, the bywater has always been an immigrant neighborhood. Okay. Uh, in a previous generation, it was Germans and Italians, and now it's um, Hispanic immigrants, mm -hmm. uh, immigrants from Honduras. Mm -hmm. We beat these two amazing women from Honduras in yes. the film. Um, and it's, it's just got this wonderful Creole flavor, mm -hmm. as they say in New Orleans. Um, many of the people who volunteered, the locals who volunteered, the skilled laborers, the yeah. union guys, uh, you'll, you might notice have uh, Italian or German last names, yeah. and that's because uh, they're either they or their parents grew up in that neighborhood. They have a lot of, New Orleans are so, New Orleans people are so neighborhood oriented and so mm -hmm. roots oriented, and people live in the same house for generations. And that's one reason uh, Hurricane Katrina was so devastating, is because these homes were almost like living, breathing parts of the family. Yeah. And I think that's, why a lot of people had such trouble coming back is they, they just couldn't bear to see their family home smashed to the ground. Um, you see that in the film in the way they talk about the the living spaces and, and we'll take a uh, when we look at some of the footage you have uh, you also uh, were able to get people returning to their homes mm -hmm. uh, and talking a little bit about what that loss means. So architecture, yeah. not just the church but homes also become a character mm -hmm. in your film. As your, how much time did you spend there making this? We made six trips. Okay. So, I made five, Russ made six. So yeah. as you're going through these different mm -hmm. trips, give us a glimpse into the filmmaker's mind about the shape the film's mm -hmm. going to take. Because what I mean is, I was fascinated to see how, you know, the imagery and the sort of locales and architecture and sense of place started to emerge as characters mm -hmm. in the film. And I wonder, about how that formed in your mind as you as you lived there. Well, one of the wonderful things about filmmaking in general and about this project in particular is the way one character will lead you to another. Okay. And for example, on our first trip down, our focus was on getting to know Father Joe, the parish priest, and Arthene, who runs the deaf ministry, mm -hmm. and also the first batch of Seattle volunteers. Um, on the next couple of trips, we got to know the local skilled union volunteers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who many of whom were also rebuilding their own homes, their own homes. or building new homes. And we man we happened to meet one guy, Dana, who Dana Colombo, uh, uh, plumber, mm -hmm. and he said, "I'll take you out to my home and uh, in St. Bernard Parish, which was pretty much wiped out." and he showed us his house, we got to know him, and then he said, oh, would you like to meet my dad? He's also volunteering uh -huh. at Blessed Silos. He's also a plumber, uh -huh. and his home also was devastated, and it became this multi-generational story that unfolded over a couple of visits. And okay. when we first visited with, um, with Dana's parents, they had not yet had the heart to clear out their house. They just couldn't face it. Yeah. It was completely devastated. Yeah. It was 10 feet of mud had come through. Um, and then on a subsequent visit, we saw the house gutted. Mm -hmm. Volunteers had gutted it for them, well, young people mm -hmm. from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And they were showing us pictures of the new place they were building in Pearl River, Mississippi, which is, a, I think, about 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. So they were moving on. Yes. But um, So one, one set mm -hmm. of relationships actually, in many ways, shaped the subsequent relationships mm -hmm. and the people we meet in the film. Right. And, 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 and as a documentary filmmaker, is that something you sort of try to preserve as an instinct? You know, when you're working on films like this, do you say to yourself, I have to remain open to what might happen? And, and is there any, you know, difficulty with that if you have a set plan of, look, I'm making a documentary. I know I have to have these events. I know I have to tell a story, you know, but so much happens in what you do in the moment. How do you sort of juggle that? Russ and I really like that spontaneity. You do. We we do. I, some people don't, you know. But we really like um, going on a shoot with some ideas about what might happen, but also with a sense of openness yes. to, you know, hey Russ, I just talked to this guy Dana. He wants to take us out to his house. Should we go? Okay, let's go. You know. And and and, and part of it is, and we're talking about Rustin, your husband, who mm -hmm. we've had on this show as a guest and is also an accomplished filmmaker. From what I understand, you work pretty much 
the two of you on your own mm -hmm. as a pair. So part of it is that you have that flexibility. You don't have a big crew. You're not beholden to anyone. You can respond to the situation as it's happening. Absolutely, and we really, um, I mean, that really works for us. Yeah. And it really defines the kinds of films that we do and that yeah. we're able to do because we are relatively light on our feet. You know, we try to only carry as much equipment as we can literally carry. <laughs> well, let's, uh, just for you know? a second, I'm curious about that because, uh, you know, potentially some of our viewers are thinking about, you know, gee, they look at this and they get inspired mm -hmm. and they get interested in the behind the scenes sense of the technology. I mean, obviously we live in an age where you don't have to carry a 35 millimeter film camera and, you know, light, uh, light it uh, uh, with gigantic lights and bring a film crew. What have you pared down to, if you would, right? You and Russ, that allows you to go out and do that. Mm -hmm. What are you shooting on? Who's doing what as, as you're actually filming? Well, that's more, you know, I'd feel more comfortable if Russ was here <laughs> taking off the equipment. But, um, but yeah, we've pared down to basically, you know, camera, yep. good microphones. Okay. We always advise young filmmakers, invest in microphones. That's the single biggest mistake people make is getting lousy field sound. Yeah. And then having to spend thousands of dollars to try to correct that. Yep. Um, so the majority of the uh, mm -hmm. sound we're going to hear in the film is field sound. Yeah. And is this recorded with boom microphones or, or actually uh, lapel likes like we're wearing today on the show? On interviews, we would use uh, either lapel yeah. mics um, or wireless mics. Um, we do a lot with wireless mics, and okay. in it, it, including sometimes we'll rig up a wireless stick mic or a wireless boom mic. Okay. And we did a lot of boom and stick mic um, on this film because we were having to really be quick on our feet just you know I mean we were literally shooting at a construction site well the, our viewers are gonna see a few moments where it's not only like you're literally in a construction site but it looks like some of the construction is coming down around you yeah I mean part of my job when we're on a shoot like this <laughs> yeah. is to protect Russ right you know? <laughs> I mean hard hats are required yeah. to make this film I yeah think, no right? we wore hard hats and yeah there were times where I had to literally you know stick my arm out and say Russ yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. that wall is coming down yeah. great yeah. Well, now let's take a look at the trailer for The Church on Dauphine Street. Everywhere you look here had a minimum of five foot of water. My house had 12 and a half foot. I had 12 feet of water. I had 10 foot of water come through my house. All my neighbors are gone. I lost everything I had, lady. Everything, including my Rottweiler. I lost my house. Katrina took it from me. All of their houses are gone. They're nothing but slabs. I thought I was looking at some of the scenes of, of maybe Hiroshima and Nagasaki because of the greens of the city, the mud. All members of my staff lost everything. Well, this is the house where I used to live. Miss Lucy succeeded in having to be lifted out with the flood. FEMA gave us more heartache and despair than the hurricane itself. They promised you the moon and they get a little block of cheese. This is the St. Gerard building. Katrina peeled off the flat roof of the building. It's the hub of the ministries. That was her lifeline, the deaf community. You have parishioners who are calling saying, I'm sorry, but we're not coming back. Now your heart reaches out for, for all of them. Someone contacted me and said, um, there's this group. I'm from uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, and, and they're Presbyterians. We have uh, 19 people here today. And if that's allowed, okay. <laughs> know your limitations. We have to build a wall right here. Do what you can do. Which was one church. It's very humbling. Do one church. I am stunned. So we picked this one. Well, if I could, I surely would Stand on the rock where Moses stood Pharaoh's army got surrounded. Oh, Mary, don't you 
if we can get the churches going, maybe the people will come back because the church is part of their life. This is not what you describe as grace. What is? With uh, C. Mason's local 567 out of New Orleans, Louisiana. Plumbers and Steamfitters local 60. International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. They've lost everything and now they see their families beginning to, you know, fracture and s stress and uh, they're hurting people. This is home. I've done 12 years in the Marine Corps and this is home. I'm fine, I'm home. <laughs> this is this. It's a little bit easier to find the body here. <laughs> That's Irish. you <laughs> So, Anne, it's been six years since uh, you and your filmmaking partner and husband, uh, Russ Thompson, were there making this film. Can you give us an update on what's happening with the people that we've met and their lives and, of course, the parish? Well, as you saw at the very end of the film, uh, Arsene and Walter got married, yes. and that was just a wonderful... Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. That what was... a su delightful <laughs> surprise when she came through. I actually didn't know who it was going to be. You were, yeah, oh, yeah. Good, well, good. I, I, yeah. I, 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 there's something very <laughs> special is going to happen here, and I thought, what, 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 what could it be? And, oh, that's delightful. You kind of hid that a little bit yeah, in the on film. Purpose. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, and that was something that unfolded in the course of filmmaking, okay. the fact that Arthene was planning to get married, <laughs> okay. and, and she was waiting for the church to be done yeah. so that she could get married in the church. And uh, uh, side note, we actually took our children down um, on that shoot, okay. and that's why you see that our son has a camera credit our daughter has a Great. PA credit. Um, anyway, so that was very moving. I talked to Arthene uh, just yesterday, and um, she uh, told me that Father Joe retired at the beginning of this year, and okay. that's been, you know, a tough transition because they've sure. had a long working relationship, and and a lot of the parishioners are sad about that too. Yeah. I'm sure he'll remain as active as he can. Yeah. Um, but it's a big transition time for them. But the church is thriving. Uh, as you may know, uh, there's a huge influx of uh, Hispanic uh, immigrants to New Orleans. Yes. A lot of them came in to help with the construction phase and stayed. And stayed there. So, in the bywater, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And so uh, a church that offers masses in Spanish, you know, as does Blessed Silos, has yes. become a gathering place for them. And, uh, and the deaf community is still coming you know for services every Sunday and they use it's a very social thing for them they also sponsor a lot of social events they have their own um, Mardi Gras crew and their own Mardi Gras ball that they yeah. do um, and uh, what's a little sad is that they're now scattered all over the greater New Orleans area many of them moved with younger family members okay. to suburbs there's been a lot of out migration Mo moving to the outer mm -hmm. areas yeah but they come into the city to go Really? So they'll still mm -hmm. yeah. take the journey to come in to mm -hmm. be engaged in that community. Yeah, yeah. So now that that says something very special. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure their experience going through the rebuilding process has a lot to do with mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, your filmmaking style, um, it's something we were chatting about mm -hmm. earlier, incorporates this notion of cinematic journalism. Um, these, this film is not just a documentary, and when I say that, I simply mean it's not just about events that occur in time that are based in fact, that are laid out for us to uh, experience. There's also a powerful storytelling uh, component to it, and also the visual language that is ultimately cinematic plays a large part in it. Can you talk a little bit about what cinematic journalism means to you? You know, it's... It's important to us to regard ourselves as journalists and to uh, do, you know, what I would characterize as real interviews. I don't prompt people. I don't coach people. It's a little laborious because I then have to go back and pull out bits of sound from what are sometimes very long interviews. So the journalism part of it is very important to us. But at the same time, mm. we also feel like the way to draw people into mm. a complex, many layered yeah. story like Katrina. And very personal. Mm -hmm, is, to, is to work with um, all that uh, 
film offers, mm -hmm. in other words, um, to create a mood through the use of, of close-ups mm -hmm. or through the use of what Russ would call textural shots, mm -hmm. um, to work with music. We're mm -hmm. always looking for music in the field, and we were really lucky on this particular project to have all kinds of different uh, music arise naturally from what was going on at the church. And is, we, that, is that an important mm -hmm. component in this uh, strategy that when you're on the topic and when mm -hmm. you're immersed in the world you're documenting that you seek those kinds of sources mm -hmm. from within the the subject itself absolutely as opposed to imposing right it, which we also did a little bit of mm -hmm. you know we mm -hmm. we obviously wove in some music that mm -hmm. was not right there in mm -hmm. front of us in New Orleans but um, but if you think about about journalism as storytelling but it's real storytelling. Mm -hmm. And you think about what the word storytelling means and you kind of take yourself back to being a child and getting into that sort of wonderful trance-like yeah. space where you're, you're being taken somewhere. That's what we like to do. It's different, it's not frontline. That's not what we do. Right, it's not, yeah. it's not expose, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not a gotcha kind of thing. It, it really is you know, looking at human lives in time and space. Mm -hmm. And what's wonderful about it is, you know, you go there and you're, as you sort of said, you're not prompting and you're not structuring situations, but the narrative unfolds. The expectations are there, the, the dramatic mm -hmm. expectations. We want to know whether this uh, uh, project is going to be successful or not, mm -hmm. because it's huge and it looks really daunting. As a matter of fact, we learn yeah. in the film, there's a there was a timeline for when they, were supposed to be open and you know they they almost didn't make the timeline um, now if you don't guide the interview mm -hmm. you, you, I imagine the subject probably because these people are not used to being on camera uh, they might even have a bit of a wall when it comes to look I'm here to mm -hmm. photograph and and probe into your personal life how does an interviewee handle that I mean if you came to me and said Andrew right. okay we're just gonna sort of work with you on your show today, if the first thing I'd say is, Ann, what do you want to know? What are the questions in advance? Where are we going with this? And if you were to say, Andrew, we're just going to talk mm -hmm. about, what, how, would you, how would you work with me on that? Let me be the subject for a sec. Well, let me clarify. I might have some questions in advance, okay. but I would prefer not to share them with you. Okay. So, so in okay. other words... You know, I do, I do have some ideas about what I'd, I'd like the person I'm talking to to talk about. Yeah. But I want them to talk. I want them to tell stories. And New Orleans, um, that the culture is very much about storytelling. That's their conversational style. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that made it fun. Um, but my favorite words when I sit down to talk to somebody are, tell me about. So I'll say, okay. you know, tell me about what happened you know with you and your family during hurricane katrina and, and a lot of times that's all i have to say okay they'll just start going you know right and in the wake of katrina and 9 11 and uh, the last uh, decade or so of american life uh, we have confronted profound questions about the role our government our institutions uh, play in our daily lives especially when it comes to disaster um, some really tough questions have been asked since Katrina specifically about that role. Your film uh, focuses on an institution that's embedded and part of a fabric of society where people came together and sort of dropped whatever differences they might have in order to single-mindedly bring back something that was important to them. I'm just curious from your point of view as a filmmaker having lived through this experience and, and being a part of the fabric of the larger society what your senses of the role our institutions can or should play in our lives. I mean, you talked in the beginning about how the people that went down there were actually uh, involved in a community work here in Seattle mm -hmm. and felt strongly enough about going there to do that work. And ultimately, you went and did that and committed a, a large part of your life to doing that. Can you talk a little bit about that from your point of view as an artist and filmmaker? You know, I often come back to Father Joe's words. Yeah. Uh, Life's not about you, it's about others. Tragedy teaches you that. And that's one of the uh, things he says in the film and something that we have used in uh, outreach about the film. Um, yeah. That was very moving to me. Um, 
you know, I feel like, although I've done plenty of volunteering in my life, yeah. the example of these people who just dropped everything, as you said, and yeah. devoted this huge amount of time, what I felt going on was this coming together of community yeah. in response to the government's lack of response. In response to the government's lack of response. Mm -hmm. So the sense that people realized, hey, you know, we have to come together. We, what, what defines us is not, you know, we, we can't sit here and wait. We've got, to, we've got to find a way to come together. And this project is a way we can actually do that. Mm -hmm. That's that's a pretty powerful um, sentiment that I think is worth sharing with everyone. And I wonder as we go forward, you know, what that means in terms of the sort of larger economic crisis and such that we face as a country. I mean, uh, what I'm gonna try to do now is lead you into talking about your future work mm. and, and sort of contextualize it in, you know, You've obviously grown and changed in the way you're approaching documentary and, and film. What's next for you in that regard? Because I'm gonna call you a social filmmaker, <laughs> a cinematic journalist, so, so your sensibilities must be seeking the next story that's gonna sort of feed into your notions of what is just and what is moral and what is right for, for people in society. I'm an optimist um, and I, I do believe that compassion and empathy can be learned, and I've, I feel like I've sort of come to believe that over yeah. the course of my life, it, yeah. partly in response to experiences like making this film and seeing it in action. Yeah. Um, one thing I saw in the making of this film that I found very moving was uh, non-religious volunteers coming together with religious volunteers, yeah. working together, leaving their you know, differing uh, beliefs, differing yeah. politics at the door, working together. So in terms of future projects, yeah. Um, I, I always look for stories that have some sort of good news element. Great. And um, I'm not sure yet what that's going to be. Okay. Uh, I have a few ideas. Okay. Russ and I are, are, frankly, we're itching to do some foreign travel. Okay, so we <laughs> and, might see your cameras on yeah. foreign soil yep. looking for that human story that's got some good news to tell. We have done some work for Global Partnerships, a nonprofit here in Seattle that mm -hmm. does micro lending in Latin America, mm -hmm. and we love that kind of work. Great. Um, we've been talking to someone, but it's still very much just in the talk phase about uh, a project in Vietnam, okay. for example. That would be very interesting to us. I also have a real... Um, because my mother died of Alzheimer's disease, that's a very important issue to me. Mm -hmm. And the Fry Art Museum has this amazing uh, program that they do uh, with people with dementia, and that's something we've actually done some filming on in May. Okay. We'll go further with that. Well, we look forward to seeing more of your great work, and you'll let us know what's next for yes. you and Russ, right? Yeah. Thanks for being on Backstory. And thank you for watching. I'm Andrew Tsao, and I'll see you again behind the scenes.